I am Joe Magician, and today we'll be pulling back from the weird and horrifying world of Varamir Six Skins last week, which took me quite a few hours to shake off, to the more grounded reality of another powerful figure in the North. No, not the Bay Jon Snow or venerable Maester Aemon, instead the lord of many titles and White Harbor, Wyman Manderly. When you talk about Wyman Manderly, most of the time you're talking about Frey Pies and Gestrite, like two people I know. However, in today we'll be talking about a very different and important moment in Wyman's story, and that is the deal he made with Davos Seaworth to serve King Stannis in exchange for Davos going full action hero to retrieve Rick and Stark from Skagos. Before we get into that, take a moment and give the stream, video, or podcast, however you're listening to us, a like, share, comment, subscribe. Um, those are pretty small actions, but they really help out with the channel and navigating the YouTube algorithm, which is a cruel mistress. And with that out of the way, I'm happy to introduce my two guests. Joining me today is both of the wonderful hands, I guess, of the Learned Hands podcast, Maester Mary and Clint, fresh off their own Wyman Manderly episodes. How are you guys doing? Hi. Hi. Mary, do you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I am Maester Mary. Um, I am the, the the right hand of the Learned Hands podcast, or the left hand. I'm not sure which hand I am, but I'm one of the hands of the Learned Hands <laughs> podcast. Um, I also have a, a WordPress page that is up from under Winterfell, and I like to do things like talk about Jon Snow for like hundreds of pages probably um and like a, a joe slash matt slash joe magician just mentioned uh we are hot off the presses uh with a wyman manderly episode covering his potential alleged violations of guest right and we have completely and totally absolved him of any guest right related crimes oh wow you, you gave away the secret mary now nobody's gonna listen <laughs> Oof. See, yeah, I mean, it's the journey, not the destination, Clint. <laughs> That's true. Um, and my name is Clint. I'm the other hand um, a, a, of the Learned Hands podcast. Uh, I, you, I also have a blog called lawsoficeandfire.com. You can follow me at Westeros Law on Twitter or on my personal Twitter account, which you should not follow at Clint W. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, Matt having us on. We... Um, had planned to do this Wyman Manderly episode, and then Matt separately, without you know, uh, without us talking about it or conspiring in any way, nope. um, asked us to uh, to be on this episode. And so it, it was uh, just a wonderful bit of serendipity. Um, we had a really a lot of fun on our guest right episodes, and uh, really digging deep on Wyman Manderly, not just um, the situation at Winterfell, but also at White Harbor, also even in between White Harbor and Winterfell. Um, and it was uh, it was just a lot of fun and amazing to look at how closely um, Wyman, as a character, scrupulously follows the rules, even when he's being <laughs> totally unscrupulous. It's great. Um, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. He like so, vaguely fo follows the rules. Very much a leather of the law, not a spirit of the law kind of guy. That is very, very true, yes. Um, also, just to start off, we have a super chat here from uh, Steven Stark, here be Dragons. He said he's playing Dungeons & Dragons, but wanted to show some love. Steven, how could you be doing that? Um, amazing panel, can't wait to watch afterward. The North Remembers. Yes, the war North Remembers, an important part of Wyman Manderly. And actually, uh, another one just popped up, The Fearless Mermaid, $2. Again, the North Remembers. Thanks, you guys, very much. That's very kind of you. Um, yeah, this this all came about because of conversation and the Song of Ice and Fire mod slack, the mythical Song of Ice and Fire mod slack, where villains like Brendan B. Fish hold sway. Um, we were just sort of talking about Wyman Manderly and Davos and Stannis, and it came up as a conversation that I decided to put onto Twitter, and I figured if I'm going to talk about Wyman Manderly, why not choose the two people that are doing a week on the guy, and are also lawyers because this is actually sort of there's a um, lawyerly ideas in here and the idea of contracts and keeping to your word and how much that matters but before we get to all the rest of that let's start off with a quote just to refresh everyone on what we're talking about because um the moment the actual bargain gets married gets buried behind the amazing speeches from davos's chapter so here we go lead us off mary 
Lord Wyman cut him off. If you will meet my price, I said. Not Stannis. It is not a king I need, but a smuggler. Robert Glover took up the tale. We may never know what all that happened at Winterfell when Sir Roderick Cassell tried to take the ca- tried to take the castle back from Theon Greyjoy's Iron Man. I should have practiced this. <laughs> Bastard Bolton <laughs> claims that Greyjoy murdered Sir Roderick during a parley. Wex says no. Until he learns more letters, we will never know half the truth. But he came to us knowing yes and no, and those can go a long way once you find the right questions. Davos understood. You want the boy. Roose Bolton has Lord Eddard's daughter. To thwart him, White Harbor must have Ned's son and the dire wolf. The wolf will prove the boy is who we say he is, should the Dreadfort attempt to deny him. That is my price, Lord Davos. Smuggle me back, my liege lord, and I will take Stannis Baratheon as my king. Just an aside. Oh, Wyman, how dare you? Oh, did this lose Mary? I think she just dropped out of the call. Oh, no. Um... I was, she'll be back. I'm sure. She'll be. She'll come back. There, there she, she is. is. She's back. Happened in like two seconds. Old instinct made Davos Seaworth reach for his throat. His finger bones had been his luck, and somehow he felt that he would need luck to do what Wyman Manderly was asking of him. The bones were gone, though. So he said, "You have better men than me in your service, knights and lords and maesters. Why do you need a smuggler? You have ships." And very good questions here from Davos Seaworth. Um, it's a very confusing offer that Wyman Manderly is making. Um, why he why is he even offering it? Why is he treating with Davos? Why is he even messing with Stannis Baratheon when he's known for the North Remembers speech? Like he's ultra Starkish. He's all about the North, and he's like, you know what? I'll help you out if you get me back, Rick and Stark. Uh, but I thought the first place we should start is Wyman's background on how he sort of de- how he treats contracts and deals with other lords in the north. Uh, Mary, you had something you want to say about this? Yeah, I just one of the things I realized going over um, all of Wyman's machinations surrounding the Frey Pies and his military actions. Um, that he's plotting against the Boltons is that he's a master diplomatic tactician. Mm -hmm. Like when he's on the toilet taking those epic shits, he's reading (laughs) an annotated version of the art of war for sure. Um, And the way that he very deliberately plays people to gain information and protect himself is it's tactical more than it is based on honor or loyalty. He's looking ahead five steps to what will they do and then how will I counter what they they do and how will that affect my inherent advantages and disadvantages. Um, And I have to respect that. And we mentioned before the stream that the way he thinks makes it seem like he is about 12 times smarter than anyone else playing the game with him. And I think that the way he treats any kind of negotiation or contract is first and foremost as a tactician, as Mm -hmm. someone that's reading the situation for strategic advantage. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think Wyman is an extremely close fine print reader. (laughs) He is the one who is like actually going through the entire contract line by line to see how it can be twisted or interpreted in a particular way that would be to his benefit. Um, And that's something that, you know, it it comes through on first read. You're like, okay, this guy seems pretty cool. We really like this uh, North Remember speech. And, you know, he's there and he's taking care of Davos, who we really like. And so that's, that's pretty, pretty great. But then when you take a step back and on reread, you realize that everything that he's doing and, and virtually everything that he's saying throughout the narrative Um, It has a particular purpose that is to his benefit and also to the what what he considers to be the North's benefit. He consistently and scrupulously takes actions that are really close to going over the line. (laughs) Just so close. Um, But he never really quite 
crosses it. He never never takes that next step. Um, and knowing where those lines are is an art in and of itself. And it's uh, it's it's uh, it's just really impressive. I'm psyched to get into more of it. Definitely, he is very much um, spirit of the law versus letter of the law sort of dude. Well, I mean, um, <laughs> the other way around. He very much like you were saying. He will tiptoe oh. on the line. Does he get around guest right in a particular way? Yes. Like, could you say he broke it in a court of law? No. But, right. I mean, the basic idea behind it, uh, we actually talked about this last year at Con of Thrones. That we, we did a, um, a guest right panel. Me, me and Mary were on it with uh, Shakes of Thrones, Nessie, um, Pat Spanagle. I f I'm, no, I'm forgetting something. Ah. I, f I feel sorry or in advance. Um, but yeah, he the the purpose of guest right is to protect your guests from exactly what Wyman does. He uses it as a tool, right? Kind of in a similar way that Euron uses the laws of the of the Ironborn in order to trap Victorian and Balon. It's a similar kind of understanding of that of their culture. Also, um, I forgot a super chat. A new one came in. Uh, Dedelphi Morphia. She says, "Thank you for the great content." No. Thank you. Very kind Thank of you. you. Uh, so I thought we would go into the background of his deals and contracts because Wyman has been sort of an ever-present figure in the North since the start of the story. He's the White Harbor is considered a major part of the North, a major power. And the first one is at the Harvest Feast. He's commanded he has to build ships with the Umbers, people he does not particularly like to make the Starks a fleet for uh, Rob's army. Roger Cassell does the commanding, but does it with Bran's authority. And Wyman actually goes through with it. He has built these ships, but they have not showed up anywhere. He has basically taken the Umbers wood, um, <laughs> weird way of saying that i'm regretting yeah. that instantly uh but he, he has taken the lumber from the umbers and they have fashioned them into ships and they are just sort of sitting in the inner harbor all the way up until a dance with dragons uh davos notices them and wyman talks about them but they haven't gone anywhere so I, like we were talking about in terms of his ability to think forward and how he will stick exactly to what he's told he has built these ships they are there but they are his ships now. They do, they do not belong to the North. They don't belong to Roos Bolton. They are Wyman ships. And he, oh, go ahead. Go. I was just going to say, they're also positioned uh, interestingly because you could clearly take them up the white knife like he did earlier when he brought uh, supplies to try and take back Winterfell from Theon. He's also been quietly recruiting this standing army. This kind of paints the picture of someone who is thinking in the, the larger terms, like, Roderick and Bran told him to build these ships to help Rob, but Wyman built them and is now using them for a very different purpose, like the extension of the defense of the North, as maybe he saw that all this was coming and he got ready for it. Do we think that he was in the process of building these ships and amassing these power, th this powerful army or the standing army, and then the Red Wedding happened and he realized that he was sort of on his own? Do we think that that's the idea? Or do we think that he was planning to use these ships for his own purposes, not for a patriotic northern you know, navy or anything like that, but he was always planning on withholding them until it benefited him? I just, I think it can be both to some extent. I think Manderley's very much the kind of person that would have recognized creating the Navy as a win-win situation. It's an opportunity for him to strengthen um, White Harbor's power relative to other Northern Lords, while at the same time supporting his liege lord against potential enemies in the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, and I think that there's a, it's also emblematic of this really powerful thing that Manderley does, which is play on other people's expectations you know he's able to construct this fleet sort of under the nose of everybody because they expect him to be using it for a certain purpose mm -hmm. and so people only see what they're looking to see and they expect him to behave in a certain way and he plays that to his advantage um by being able to maneuver this fleet in a way that people aren't expecting him to do yeah, I think that's a good point. And it's also, this is supposed to be a partnership. Like, a main reason that Cassell told him to work with the Umbers is that they don't really get along. This was sort of a, a buy in the north thing. And Wyman has essentially taken the lumber and said, these are now my ships. 
um, it, its leverage, he has somehow turned, uh, he has turned a command from the from the Lord of the North and to leverage over the umbers in order to be like, well, you guys gave me the, the lumber. Thanks a lot. I'm not giving you the ships until, unless you do what I want. And when we look at what's happening in the winds of winter and the battle of ice and how it seems like they're working together, it appears that Wyman's use of this naval power is like unbelievably. He has turned that into a way to make somebody else basically subservient to him just by yeah. withholding the ships that he was told to build already. It's so I'm I'm going to do my Star Wars reference number 1. Number 1 guys. Right. Over yeah. under 3 and a half. Y'all can yeah. count. Um but this is an example of how much um Wyman reminds me of the expanded universe character um Grand Admiral Thrawn. The entire premise of this character, if you're not into Star Wars, is that he's like this master tactician who's able to read art and situations in order to plan battles ahead. And so he becomes this um, <laughs> the maneuver. Frank is very excited, by the way. Hat, hat to him, Frank. Um, and he's able to gain tremendous strategic advantage um by taking small actions often that other people wouldn't recognize. And so the way that Wyman deals with the fleet and the Umbers is just very prototypical Grand Admiral Thrawn. Um, <laughs> and, and that's who Wyman has, has been reminding me of on this most recent reread. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's emblematic of everything else we're gonna talk about. We have uh, a few more examples we're gonna go through, but yeah, Wyman, takes these opportunities or obligations thrust on him and always turns them to his advantage, which is really hard to do. It's something you see out of like characters like Varys and Littlefinger, but I don't think Wyman is often considered in that intelligence realm where most people see him as the North Remembers guy. They see him as the one that is doing the fray pies, but like you were talking about from the, from the very top of the, the document, it's He's extremely clever. This is very, very hard stuff to do. I mean, he makes the Umbers look like fools. He takes their resources, turns it around, and now they're beholden to him for something he was told he has to do. It's like, that's amazing. Um, also, yep. super chat here from uh, Frank Bum. Apparently, he likes uh, Admiral Theron, so $5 from him. Thank you, Frank. Way to go, Mary. You apparently got Frank to open his wallets for, <laughs> for Admiral Thrawn. Who would have thought? That's All the way it was All part of hard. my grand master plan. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of master plans, the next one up here is Lady Hornwood. So what happens is Lady Danella Hornwood uh, becomes a widow, and there's sort of a succession crisis of sorts, but it's... It's not really an obvious one. Um, the the Hornwood sits between sort of Winterfell, the Dread Fort, and White Harbor. It sort of serves as the buffer between their lands. And at the Harvest Festival, everybody's trying to marry Danella. But in particular, Wyman is pushing really, really hard on it. And it's because... Hey. hey oh, Wyman pushing. You know what's up. He's, he's, <laughs> uh, just because he's old doesn't mean he's not horny. Yeah, oh, I mean... Oh, he's horny. So horny. He's extremely horny. Horny for power. Got it. That's right. Um, he correctly recognizes that losing Danella and the Hornwoods to the Boltons is the first step to White Harbor falling, basically. It would essentially, it would um, double their lands, essentially, if they got control of it. They would give them so much more soldiers. It would push the Boltons to the point that they may be an, an independent faction that could knock him over. And instead, he pushes really hard to marry Danelle. When that doesn't work, he then takes the next step and seizes the Hornwood after Ramsay kidnaps her, after he loses out on the marriage. And all these moves are sort of small things. It's like, oh, Wyman took the, took the Hornwood, so what? Oh, Wyman was trying to marry Danella, so what? Well, these are him understanding very acutely the politics of the North and the power structures that are being upset unbelievably by Danella Hornwood's husband. Who would have thought the axis of power in that in this situation is that guy? But Wyman figures it out and works to make it go in his favor. Well, tries to anyway. Yeah, I think this is another this is a really interesting example of how his knowledge of the different families in the North is really important. Um, and so it's not just we learn um, that 
one powerful piece of knowledge that John has is deploying knowledge of like the Northern clans in order to aid Stannis. Um, but Manderly too has, I think, a really extensive knowledge of the politics of the different families in the North. And what's interesting is I very much doubt that any outsider would be able to have the, the level of knowledge that, that Manderly has. And, and this particular action is, is really, I think, a good example of, of that. What do you think? Yeah, that sense. Uh, no, I think that makes sense. He uh, again, this is one of those things where on first read, first read, you think, okay, well, this guy, he's lonely. You know, he wants to bang <laughs> hoarding man early. Uh, I can understand that. Who, whomst among us, um, hasn't hasn't wanted that? But um, but again, you're you're uh, once you dig deep and realize, oh no, there there's a very very good political reason for him to do so. It all makes sense and it all clicks in. Um, that you know, especially with um, Lady Janella's son who died, who, and I forget his name. Um, and was that at the Whispering Wood, something like that? I think so. I um, that, like, I think he's one of the ones that Jamie kills. Uh, but setting all that aside, like that, without him, that there's going to be a power struggle, and so power abhors, abhors a vacuum, and he is trying to prevent a vacuum from being created it's very it makes a lot of sense in particular it shows that he is aware that the boltons are a threat to him even at this point when there's no hint of their treachery when Roos hasn't really done anything yet there's no outward reason to doubt the boltons loyalty to ned it's not like they've refused to march they've gone down with rob i mean they've defended ned and manderly sees this and says I know Roos better than everyone else. I know that the horn would do something he wants and it's a threat to me in Winterfell and makes a move to try and stop it. Unfortunately, this is one of those times where it actually blows up in his face because um, while he does save the Hornwood, the Boltons use Theon's sacking of Winterfell as a trap for Manderly and end up killing some of his knights, not too many, but also uh, also burning some of his ships and taking his supplies and eventually taking the Hornwood, essentially. And outmaneuvered is not something that happens to Wyman very much, but it's not he wasn't outmaneuvered because he didn't know it was happening. He was outmaneuvered because he didn't know Ramsay's, um, the full extent of Ramsay's savagery, basically. Yeah, and right. it's, you can your tactics can always be outmaneuvered by someone who is willing to creatively violate norms and laws in a way that you don't expect. Um, and and here it's it's that deception that that kicks him in the butt. Yeah, and I wonder if this is one of the points where he made or started making the conscious decision to withhold some of his um, his strength from the fight to preserve it because he saw that there would likely be a power struggle regardless of what happens in the south uh with rob's army so you know he committed some portion of his troops to i don't know rescuing lady hornwood or securing the hornwood lands he lost and at that point he has to stand sit back and and sort of uh reassess his options and say okay we know that the boltons have started taking aggression uh against northerners um, I, I, I have to assume that he assumed that that would continue. And if that's the case, whatever happens in the South is not going to prevent bloodshed and bloodletting up in the North. And I need to raise my own army to protect my own lands. And I, that, that tracks, you know, it mm -hmm. seems logical from his perspective. Yeah, it's a great example of how feudal politics work as well. Um, you're constantly having lords that are having to jockey for position and security, and they are concerned not only about demonstrating loyalty to their liege lord, but also about a shifting balance of power that mm -hmm. could lead to an uh, alliance that would upset um support of the lesser lords for their liege lord. So there's a constant fear of a shifting alliance putting you uh, and those you support out of power. And so I think this is a, a great example of um, the role that marriages play in shifting feudal alliances, as well as how the failure of 
I guess, marriage-related diplomacy <laughs> can lead to out-and-out -out hostilities. Yeah, just an amazing example of his uh, skill in this society. I mean, the Manderleys are the outsiders. They're the Southerners that came north. They follow the face of the Seven. Um, but they, Wyman himself really does have an amazing grasp of the local politics, understanding of which where's where people are vulnerable where the starks are vulnerable where he essentially needs to act as their backup where he needs to intercede to stop the boltons wherever he can knowing that somehow he knows that this is on Roos's mind unbelievably correct way to go um way to go wyman and there's also something here that i noticed um from this harvest festival is that wyman made a very big impression on bran stark um, he came yeah. away with really good impressions of Wyman, in particular because he felt that Wyman didn't show him a lot of pity. A lot of the other lords sort of treated him like the the broken person that he has become in terms of physically, but Wyman sort of approaches him more on a human level. And it's important to note, if you're talking about like how George is trying to frame Wyman, if you look back from A Dance with Dragons to to this moment... Bran almost doesn't go north of the wall, and he almost doesn't go north of the wall because he wants to go to White Harbor. He wants to go to Wyman Manderley. So if you're positioning Wyman Manderley against Blood Raven, and George is doing that intentionally, showing you that this he seems just like this big fat oaf who's sitting there in White Harbor, not really doing much, but in terms of the effect he's having on people and his ability to create these relationships that may last a long time he almost gets the future three-eyed crow one of the most powerful people in westeros to give up his destiny to come hang out with him in white harbor that's something yeah i never thought about it that way that's um i i, I think you you sort of missed the notion that bran could didn't have to go north and that he was actually uh convinced to do so i mean if i were bran and i were in his situation White Harbor is definitely where I'd want to go, right? Yeah. I mean, like, that's... They uh, make well, great pies. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a cool dude. It's a, it's a port city. You know, that's cool. I don't know. Like, it seems, seems like the place to go, and he has to, he has to be sent north on his destiny towards kingship or whatever. Yeah. Kind of incredible to think about. Blood Raven almost loses almost loses his star people, the guy he's been working at for maybe decades at this point, to Wyman Manderly being nice to Bran. Oh. Says a lot about him. Yeah. Um, and then the other big one that comes up is the deal that he made with Tywin and Cersei. Well, sort of Cersei. Who's in control of King's Landing in A Feast for Crows? Kind of Cersei, kind of... Tom and I don't know. It's it's all big mess. But the important thing is that after the Red Wedding, um, bad things have happened to Manderly. He only committed about 1,500 troops to Rob's cause, which is not a huge amount when you consider White Harbor's size, but he did commit both of his sons. He sends Wendell and Willis. Willis, the older son with the with his two daughters, Wyla and Winifred. Man, they really do have a naming scheme like the Lannisters going. All these yeah. uh, similar ideas. Um, and Wendell is killed, but the phrase in particular, take Will's hostage, he's sent to Harrenhal, and Wyman has to, is put in the position by Tywin Lannister to make a deal with him to support Roos, or essentially he's going to burn down White Harbor. And like we were talking about, I think, earlier with the Umbers and the command to build the lump, to build the ships, Wyman unbelievably turns this horrible situation, one son dead, the other one in captivity, Tywin threatening to kill you and everyone you love, and he makes it to his advantage. Um, yeah, one of the things that we talked about in our last um, episode was um, this, this deal that he ends up striking with the Iron Throne, whatever it is, and how that interplays with the guest right that he eventually offers the phrase, Jared Rhaegar and whatever the other guy's name was. Simon. 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 Simon, Simon that's right. <laughs> um, uh, when they get to White Harbor. And that the the deals are very, they're very intertwined. Um, uh, yeah, we argue in our episode that, that um, they're not the same deal, but you can make an argument that one deal is consideration for the other. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so it, you know, he is playing again a very fine game with this with his agreement, but with the Iron Throne, um, and really has to play everything almost perfectly in order for it to work out. And then it does. He <laughs> even even when this wild card that he was not expecting, Davos Seaworth showing up, um, he is able to secure the safe return of his son, or his grand. It's his son, right? It's his son, Willis. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's of his son um, in like a pit of vipers, right? Like that could threaten to like this cauldron could completely overfill and everything could could take him. Um, but he manages to to do it just by stubbornly refusing to give an inch when I think a lot of other people would. Um, and so I, it's it's again, just really impressive. Yeah, I think this is a really good example, again, of some of the tactics that Wyman is deploying, um, deploying and how well he knows his enemies, but also how good he is at masking his true intentions mm. and using misdirection, cooperating with Tywin um, in in combination with sort of his submission to the phrase creates this impression that he has deliberately tried to create of himself as being, you know, an old fat weak man, mm -hmm. um, as being a coward. And, you know, Wyman says over and over in his dance with dragons chapters, like they think that I'm just a fat coward and the structure of these deals, um, and his motivation to protect his son plays in to that image. And so on the one hand, it, you you can see that someone that is very concerned with their honor and their own image would not be willing to use this kind of tactic. No, Ned and, Stark would never do this. No, he would never do it. But for Wyman, it, it works brilliantly because making this deal plays into this entire image that he's cultivated, that he's not truly a threat. All the while, he knows that he is. It's, you know, like in poker, it's it's kind of the opposite of a bluff. It's rope-a-dope, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what he's doing. Um, and I think it's it's brilliant. And this deal and cooperation with the Boldens and the Lannisters is central to creating the image that he's weak. Definitely. If we look at the actual terms of what he got, this is so much more... But it seems like it seems like a bad deal on its face. It seems like Tywin won this. So what if until you look at it closely? So right. what he agrees to do is he agrees to uh, allow the phrase into White Harbor and to marry two of his granddaughters, Wyla and Winifred, to the phrase. He also agrees to Willis returning, and he has to give up three thousand gold dragons. Not that's a that's a big, big number. That's a lot of gold he's giving up and his claim on the Hornwood. But when you look at it closely, like I was saying, this is actually in Wyman's favor. He's already, he's fabulously rich. Those 3,000 dragons do not mean much to him, especially not in the north. He has ships. He has a standing army. He doesn't. He's not going to be hiring sellswords. He already has the resources he wants. Giving up the claim on the Hornwood, the Hornwood's gone. The, the right. Boltons have it. He gave up nothing for that. He gets his he gets his heir back alive, which is a massive deal for any lord. Like that's the kind of thing that makes the ballast the Malisters bend the knee. Other lords completely roll over and show their belly when you have their heir. Wyman gets him back, and he gets the phrase in White Harbor, isolated from the twins, meaning they no longer have the strength of the South protecting them. He has essentially taken his enemies and isolated them in his own lands, in his own hall, and given up things he does not care about for everything he wants. Yeah, it's also worth noting that his agreement to marry his granddaughters to the phrase also gives up nothing because he's going to turn around and kill the phrase. Yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, sure, I will give you the hand of my granddaughters. That's, uh, oh, it's a, it's a big deal for me. And, you know, knowing all along that he's going to murder the fuck out of him. And so what, what is he giving up? I, like the, the only thing of value of real tangible value that he gives up is three, 3000 gold dragons, which if you have it seems like a small price to pay to get your son back. Mm -hmm. Right. He's invaluable. Is, it's such a lawyerly negotiation tactic um, in the sense that he has, as you guys both mentioned, 
a very good idea of what is valuable to him and what is valuable to his enemies. Um, but at the same time, he is making like he is giving up something that's a big deal, but it doesn't really matter to him. Um, and that is, you know, that's, it's negotiation tactics 101. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, also, sorry to interrupt. We got some super chaps here. Uh, Jaded Redhead, $5 for Amy's name day. Uh, Amy L in the chat. It is her birthday. So happy birthday, Amy, from great. me and the learned hands here. Uh, another one from uh, Frank B. He says, Wyman is Mike McDermott from Rounders. Yes, he is. He's watching Tywin with his Oreos and deciding that he has him and he does. And Cersei, he he absolutely destroys Cersei in these negotiations. And a uh, dollar fifty from the Swedelands, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, again, saying happy birthday to Amy. Um, to get back to the point of how this affects it, this negotiation seems like a small thing. Like, who cares about the heir of White Harbor when you're talking about the realm in general? But Wyman's close negotiations, and in particular, the phrase term up with Wendell's bones, and Wyman says, that's not good enough. I'm not doing anything until Willis is here like Tywin yep. promised. So Cersei now has to go get Willis. And it's so important to maintaining for her to maintain the Boltons in the north and keep the Starks from regaining power that she sends Jamie personally into the Riverlands to Harrenhal to find Willis, put him on a boat and send him to White Harbor. So all these great chapters we love about Jamie and his journey to becoming the new person he is and reforging his identity are because Wyman Manderly is is calling the bluff of the phrase and the Lannisters knowing that he has the ability to do so. He is so powerful that he is driving the plots of that people love. Unbelievably, it's Wyman Manderly doing it. It's such a power move. Like, I love it. It's... It's something else. Like we, th we hear about a lot of other people being ransomed. We hear a lot about deals that Tywin is making, but this one has arg inarguably changed the story in a very drastic way. Wyman doesn't make this doesn't make this demand. It's unlikely Jamie ever has to leave King's Landing again. It is only for Willis that this has to happen, and she can't trust anybody else. This is just, I mean, to, to kind of extend the poker analogy, like everybody knows that Wyman in this situation is kind of the big stack mm -hmm. because of the strategic importance of White Harbor. And that allows him to bully people around. Um, you know, he's he's throwing his weight around to use the kind of metaphor that George would. Um, and he's able to do that because of his strategic position. And he knows that people have no choice but to sort mm -hmm. of fold to this demand. Um, and that's why it's such a brilliant move. It really demonstrates his tactical ability. I mean, he rolls Tywin, and then he absolutely, like I said, he absolutely destroys Cersei. Like, she capit capitulates completely to his demands. The Freys have no choice. They're out of luck until Willis shows up, especially because of his previous demand. Well, not his demand, but his allowing the Freys to show up and to get their marriages, they can't leave. They can't go anywhere. So now they are hostages that he's holding against the the twins and Cersei that it's essentially he has turned this back on them. It's like, you have Willis hostage, I have these Freys hostage. Give me Willis or else they're gonna die or something bad will happen to him, which is like we we're talking about, an unbelievable turning on its head of use of power and negotiation ability. Right, and it again warrants mentioning that um, the threat is not over to the phrase once once Willis is returned. It's only right? gone higher. Right, exactly. Um, you know, if you're Walder Frey and you actually care about these phrase, you pull them immediately upon him, uh, upon Wyman Manderly refusing to um, to marry or or, or give. Uh, the granddaughters um, in, as soon as the phrase show up, right? Like if, if it's really why, uh, excuse me, it's really Walder's blunder mm -hmm. or the phrase blunder to stick around. If I'm them, I'm getting the fuck out of there because uh, just as you said, they're in a, an extremely vulnerable position. They think, and this is, it's kind of ridiculous, but they think that, that guest right will protect them, ha -ha. which is insane given coming from the phrase, but you know, Fuck the phrase, they're idiots, and you know, <laughs> they, they got what, what was coming to them. 
I think this is a good opportunity to talk maybe about Frey Pies and the guest right stuff that you guys have been talking about in your podcast. Um, so how do you think that also ties into what we've been talking about, his ability to use negotiation and close reading and power to get what he wants with nobody noticing, basically? My favorite example is his strategic use of the guest gifts. Mm -hmm. And so to just back that up a little bit, you know, he knows that in order to go to the wedding at Winterfell between not Arya <laughs> and Ramsay, their phrase and the Manderly hosts have to travel. So he's playing upon, I think, and maybe the the elephant in the room or the walrus in the room, whatever you want to call it, which is that eventually their protection by guest right has to end. And so he gifts the phrase with these palfreys, which is um, symbolic of guest right ending, the giving of the guest gift. Um, and what I love about that is that he's putting a very fine point on the fact that look, you're on your own on the road. You're no longer protected by guest right. Um, and I think that's a great example of him simultaneously um, throwing his weight around his big stack, saying, look, you have to, you have to leave. We've all agreed um, what the next step in this process is, while also kind of... Uh, giving a metaphorical middle finger to the phrase as they leave. Um, and, and I love that because then once they get to Winterfell and he's murderated the three <laughs> phrase, um, everybody is so on edge because it's this, um, in, okay, in international law, you would call it a security dilemma, right? Like both sides know that, uh, they, they're they insufficiently protected. And they don't know the phrase and the Boltons don't know when is appropriate to take the next move because they both sense that you know, hostilities between them are likely to, um, to boil up again. So even though they're there for a wedding and guest right is supposed to apply, one of the things that we talked about in our most recent episode is that everyone is so on edge during that um, that time in Winterfell, you know, not only mm -hmm. does Wyman very deliberately make a show of bringing his own food and no one can really call him on it, right? Because he's cultivated this reputation as fat and gluttonous. So they assume that the food is just there because he likes to eat. But that's just a, you know, it's just a cover for the fact that he's dropping these signs that he's not going to abide by guest right. So it's a perfect example of walking the line between the norms that are created by law, um, while at the same time putting himself in a strategic position where no one can really call his bluff. Because what would the phrase and, and, and Boltons do um, if they were to engage in open hostilities against Wyman at that point? They would be screwing themselves, mm -hmm. which, you know, eventually we get to that point. So um, that was long, but I, I just think it's such a brilliant a brilliant set of moves uh, by by Wyman to get to the point of the fray pies. Yeah, uh, and I, I'd like to underline a couple of the points that Mary made just by pointing out. So the guest gifts, he asks about guest gifts, and he, it's not like Wyman goes to the phrase and says, <clears throat> here are three guest gifts. Here's a, a nice sweater for you to wear along the road. <laughs> no, he gives them palfreys specifically because uh, they don't have them. Uh, they they need transportation in order to get from point A to point B. And so from his perspective, it's like, hey, I, I can't use them because I'm too fat to sit a horse. You guys go ahead. It's fine. Here are, you know, like you, you're going to want some horses, of course, right? Go ahead. Take these three, right? I just got them lying around. I got an extra one. Feel free. And so they're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to take that. Um, rather than like intellectually understanding that what he's doing is sealing their own doom. Moreover, everybody knows he's too fat to sit a horse. He's giving them horses. So they're going to go faster. So the idea that they get separated, oh, this narrative that uh, are separated on the road, that they're separated on the road, it comes out and he's able to say, oh, well, they just, they just got ahead and I don't know what happened to them. It's fine. You know, like I, it wasn't me. You have no proof. 
Um, so it, there's a nuance and a, a sort of, uh, it's a, the grace note of that aspect is that he gave them horses specifically because that furthers his own designs. And it, it's similar to the, this idea of when he gets into Winterfell um, that he's just got a bunch of food and it's like, no, 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 I don't need, I don't need your food because I, I've got all this good stuff. Um, and the the list of stuff that he brings is uh, ridiculous. It's we we went through it uh, on our lap. <laughs> it is it is long uh, and uh, sounds amazing, but again, it just it all plays within his own narratives. This is a man who not only understands um, what he wants, but he understands how he is perceived, and so he's able to take advantage of both of those things. Uh, at the same time. Excellent. It's excellent awesome. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. I just, I wanted to say something that you reminded me of Clint is the way that he disguises what would otherwise be open acts of aggression in these right. really good stories mm -hmm. that he's created. The palfreys are an example. The food is an example. He has this great excuse. So what, in a different context might look like um, hostility can't be viewed as hostility because the combination of the way that he manages to frame the narrative and the strategic power that Wyman has in the situation that prevents anyone from being able to call his bluff. It's uh, honestly the same thing with the Hornwoods. Like um, people in the chat pointed out, well, his excuse for that is that she's his cousin and they've known each other for a long time and it's not going to be a loving like childbearing relationship it's like he's just trying to help out his poor cousin who lost her husband and her son and it's like no this him trying to take the hornwood is equally an aggressive act against the boltons as much as it is <clears throat> as they are trying to push on to him sure but he, he has a cover story he has a perfect cover story that's a great point uh, so and he also has a great view and here's the here's the other thing about fray pies that i would we, i just don't want to I don't want to miss talking about is he gets to watch, he gets to watch like his greatest enemy consume his own children in front of a bunch mm. of people and enjoy the view. And so there is a kind of like mustache spinning evil to that, um, that it's, he gets to watch his entire plan unfold in the most poetic way possible. Um, and that is, I, I just, it can't be understated that he's not only doing this because he has some kind of, you know, brilliant strategic mind. He also is taking a tremendous amount of delight in plotting his mm. revenge. His revenge is best served, I guess, hot in pies in that case. Um, and to move on to the the main part of it, we're talking about Davos and his deal with and uh, Wyman's deal with Davos for Stannis. Um, I, this is one thing that really underlines all of his plans is that nobody ever knows what his win conditions are. They all think they know what he wants, but right. he always has a secret motive that nobody can really understand. And that is most on display, even in this chapter with Davos, where, so the basic behind it is that Davos goes to White Harbor looking for support for Stannis. He's smuggled himself around, he's snuck into White Harbor, and he's trying to get some help for Stannis as his campaign's not going great. And he knows Wyman still has all his strength. People notice he only sent 1,500 men with Rob. Um, his fleets are still there. He's still rich. His city has not been attacked. This is a perfect ally for Stannis to have. So Davos goes to try and do this. And while he's in the city, in the wine sinks... Also, by the way, you you have to know that Wyman knows Davos is in the city long before he goes up to the garden and says, I want to see Wyman. He probably knows that afternoon that Davos Seaworth has showed up, the famous smuggler. But, but he allows him to go about his business in the city, he goes to the wine sinks, he goes to the taverns, and he hears that not only is Wyman cooperating with the Boltons of Freys in the Iron Throne, but he is ignoring pleas from the North, that he is refusing to help anybody against the Boltons. Um, in particular, Robert Glover, who uh, we find out is actually My boy. His, his best friend, and they are helping each other out massively. Robert Glover has been set up as the character making this point that Wyman is abandoning the North. He's been going around White Harbor trying to get uh, an audience. He's been trying to get help. And Wyman has publicly been telling him no. 
and tell and tell him to go screw but not leave the city it's a perfect act between them um so davos gets frustrated by all this news he's like oh, wait why manderly how could he be like this he goes up to the guard and demands an audience and Wyman immediately arrests him, but puts him in house arrest, not in the dungeons at this point, and then keeps him isolated for 18 days, presumably while he writes letters and lets the news filter out in the north and down to King's Landing that he has Davos Seaworth and what he's going to do with him. And this presents him with some interesting choices on the face. So the first one is, well, he could accept this alliance with Stannis. Um, it, for an ambitious character like Wyman with a lot of strength, this seems like maybe a good option in, in some ways. If Stannis wins the Iron Throne, Wyman could become the Paramount of the North. Stannis will have that ability with the Starks gone. But right. it also creates big problems for him that it will isolate him from the rest of the Northmen he's been trying to work with because they all don't like Stannis. None of them want to serve him. The only ones that do are doing it because... They have no other choice, basically. So it would make him an outsider in the North when he's trying to be a major part of the culture. Also, it mean, it would be an open dec declaration that his deal with the Iron Throne and the Freys and the Boltons are now off, and this would start a war almost immediately. He would have to kill the Freys. Boltons would probably would then have a good reason to march on White Harbor and call the rest of the North to do it. So while this seems like a good option for somebody you think is ambitious and intelligent, it's actually a pretty bad one for him. His second one is he could refuse this alliance. And doing so allows him to continue to abide by the terms of the agreements he's already made and keep the line he's been pushing out there, that he is loyal, that he is keeping to his word, that no, 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 Cersei, you do not have to send your army north to burn White Harbor. Everything's going good. And those that know that he's secretly scheming know the plan hasn't changed. He is still doing the same thing. He is sticking to, I am loyal to the Iron Throne and my deal. That's great for him. And then the other one is he could ignore it, pretend Davos never showed up. That's that's a really that's also a bad option. It doesn't change anything for him. It's just like status quo. Whereas when you and then you look at what uh, Wyman does, it makes sense why he chose the kill Davos option. It's the one that helps him the most in his current scheme. Um, and we know that he essentially fakes killing Davos. He puts a Actually, we, the way George writes it is so cruel. He does it in a Feast of Crows, and you just hear Davos die. And it's like, what? Davos? He's dead? Um, another fabrication from Manderly. He kills Dav Davos and puts the hands and a head on his walls with an onion shoved in the mouth. And essentially, he goes even further with his second one. He underlines the point that not only am I not with Stannis, not only am I not leaving my deal, I am so about this deal i will kill stannis's hand of the king like yeah that's amazing yeah i think that that's why i, I mean i don't think he could have just ignored it right no he we know that davos was in white harbor for quite a long time uh prior to the t time that he demanded an audience so people would have seen davos people mm -hmm. that presumably somebody knows that Davos is there. And if he just pretends to never see him, then that undercuts the narrative that he's trying to uh, put forth, which is that he's he, he's a, a a safe actor to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. If he just says, no, that's, that's nonsense, then people are going to start looking at him askance and being like, what the fuck is he up to? So he's got to like play it straight uh, or publicly straight. And, you know, hear this request in front of a lot of people make it very clear in public that he's rejecting that request and sending him back to the dungeons uh, and and going on with his machinations i think um the the options that you per present the three options are are correct i think those are the three correct options but there's a clear best right one yeah best one from his perspective and he not only chooses that one, but then chooses it in a way that he doesn't have to to commit all the way. He's able to choose this. It's it's this fourth option, which is the middle row um, of option one and option two, while getting the the benefits of both. Uh, so that's again, he, does, he plays it masterfully. 
Yeah, I'll have some more to say on this further down in the outline. But one thing that occurred to me as you were laying out the the potential options is, you know, Stannis's game in sending Davos was maybe not the smartest thing no. ever. <laughs> um, because if if oh, Wyman no. if Wyman is playing by the book, um, what he's putting Wyman in this terrible situation. Like this is a potential ally, and mm. if if you're assuming that this is going to go by the book, then you've just put your ally potential ally in an untenable situation. Now, of course, the advantage of having Davos the smuggler as your hand is that maybe there is potential for things to go not by the book. Um, so, so I think that's part of the mode in sending him, but it still just doesn't strike me as a, uh, it shows to me this huge disparity in how well Wyman thinks tactically versus how Stannis thinks tactically. Are you suggesting that <laughs> Stannis Baratheon doesn't really know how to interact with people well? Mary, is that Weird. the suggestion you're making? He, he may not be the best diplomat. I think he's a pretty that's... bad diplomat. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's shocking. Sh shocking. I, I've never heard anything about this. I thought St Stannis' whole thing was empathy and understanding political situations <laughs> and all, all yeah. these wonderful it, things. It's it's interesting, right? Because Stannis might be a very good tactician on the battlefield, hmm. um, but he doesn't combine a knowledge of military tactics with a knowledge of diplomacy. Um, and is that's why he's such an interesting contrast to Wyman, because Wyman he's, understands that's the military implications of politics and diplomacy in a way that I think Stannis does not grasp, and very few other actors uh, in Westeros grasp. That's true. That's right. Uh, also, pointing out, um, I just looked at the chat numbers. There's about 230 people here, but only 95 likes. So, you know what, guys? Slam that like button. Let's get that up, up over 100. Um, smash it. Smash it. Smash it hard. Like, smash it like you were smashing a fried pie. I don't know. I don't know if that's the. Oh, interesting. Are you, yeah. are you assuming that Wyman would. Never mind. I'm going to let that thought go. Um, sure. That was a bad thought. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also, uh, I left out of my summary that Wyman has this massive, huge um, showing in the Merman's court where he brings Davos before him. He publicly embarrasses him and Stannis, um, does this whole show for the phrase, and then obviously says he's going to kill him. Doesn't happen. Um, and there's also something uh, when we're getting to what actually happened to Davos, which is he was sent to the wolf's den and kept as a prisoner by Sir Bartimus. Um it's that Wyman presents himself to Davos as if he is presenting his real personality, his real, um, his real machinations when he sees them, because he's he admits to well, I, everyone thinks I'm I'm doing my squat. I can be straight with you, me and you. Like the, this is the real thing. This is a secret. Nobody knows about this. But it's it's another one of those things where Wyman is again creating another a believable mask for what he really wants. And that gets to what happened, what he wants Davos to do. He has somehow through with Robert Glover, uh, acquired Wex Pike, Theon's mute squire, who knows that Rickon, Bran, Stark are both alive and the general directions they left in, which is a massive piece of information in the North. That information is incredibly explosive for their politics if the boltons knew anything about this they would be sending armies to skagos and maybe to the wall to try and find bran and also rickon wyman has this and has told nobody he's kept it to himself and using wex he makes an offer to davos that essentially the terms are this you davos seaworth personally go to skagos the place with all the cannibals and the unicorns you find Rickon Stark and his dire wolf. I forgot about this. I reread it. He asks for the dire wolf too. Bring them back to me, Wyman Manderly. And if you do, I will swear fealty to Stannis with Rickon as Lord Paramount of the North. Now that is a very, very fascinating deal he is offering because in this situation, Wyman is in the situation is he could demand to be Lord Paramount himself. That, that is, a lot of people would make that demand with that kind of power over Stannis and Davos in the situation. And instead, he says, 
bring back a Stark boy lord with his dire wolf, and if you do, we're we're good to go. What do you guys think about that deal? I uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit. I'm not going to go to the point of whether or not I think mm -hmm. he intends to keep this deal, but I I do think that. Um, the fact that he wants the dire wolf back indicates to me one of two things. One, that he recognizes the power of the Stark symbols in mm -hmm. the North. Um, and he, he obviously, so, so that's one, you know, the power of the dire wolf as a Stark symbol in motivating the North. Two, I mean, I think he may also understand the significance of the dire wolf in a magical sense. So it could be that he thinks bringing back the dire wolf will also be further proof of, um, of Davos's loyalty, you know, because the direwolf could slip out, could kind of sniff out if there was any duplicity, um, and and I think three, like, it's just it's just a fascinating, um, it, it's just a fascinating example of how the political and the magical plots are intertwined here, mm -hmm. and how um, uh, how Wyman recognizes that, and and I also think. He does have some true loyalty to the Starks. It's possible to be loyal to someone because they have helped you rise mm -hmm. to power. Oh, dear God, here's a Star Wars reference. Two. Like Darth Vader <laughs> is loyal to Emperor Palpatine in part because they reinforce each other's power. That's a strategic alliance, but the loyalty between them is real. Um, and so even if we look at, at this the alliance between the Starks and the Manderleys as one that is, you know, entirely opportunistic. That doesn't mean that there can't still be like emotional loyalty mm -hmm. towards the Starks. And I think bringing the direwolf back also represents that um, like emotional loyalty to the Starks. I think it also like having the direwolf as well offers a contrast between fake Arya at Winterfell. Mm. So it's a way for him to say, yeah, that you've got, Stark over there. I've got Rick on. There's his direwolf. There is no dispute that that is a a a real Stark. That is the heir, um, and he is the one who should be sitting Winterfell, not Ramsay Bolton, Ramsay Snow, and fake Arya over here, mm -hmm. who's not a, who's obviously not Arya. And and uh, in addition, Rick on well, presumably might be able to testify that. That's not Arya. That's Jace. Yes, absolutely. You know? That's not my sister. Sorry. He can say. Absolutely yep. undercuts the Boltons perfectly. Um, also, uh, Aziz History of Westeros show up in the chat. Hey, Aziz. How's it going? Um, and I, one part about this I wanted to focus on before we get to is Wyman going to keep his word or did he intend to? I wanted to talk about how he gets Davos to agree to this because we were talking about how he uses his big stack ability, how he uses. Mm -hmm. Um, the power he has over people to get them to agree to deals that seem good for them, but are actually really good for Wyman himself. And this is maybe the perfect example. Davos is not free to say yes, to say no to this. Wyman right. has not only fake killed Davos, but he has put him in prison. So if Davos wants to walk out of White Harbor ever, if he doesn't want to live out the rest of his life with Sir Bartimus hanging out in the wolf's den, he has to agree to this. So Wyman is able to put make him agree to something he absolutely does not want to do. And Davos puts up a fight about it, where he's like, I don't want to go to Skagos. You know people that know the North and this place better. You have ships, you have knights, send them. And Wyman turns it back on him and say, no, this is not negotiable. You're going, Davos the smuggler. And it's really interesting. Um, Davos feels really uncomfortable during this. Like we, I, during the opening quote, we said that um, he tried to get his finger bones to, to grab them to soothe himself because he knows that everything about this probably leads to Davos' death if he does what Wyman asks him to do. Um, like obviously the first one is maybe he goes to Skagos, gets killed and eaten by cannibals. Bad situation. The second one is that Wyman has already figuratively killed Davos. So at this point, there's no safety anymore in Davos's identity. He could just kill him, throw his body into the into into the uh, the narrow sea, and it's over with. He's already taken the political hit for killing Davos. So that 
that um that defense he has of being dab of being stannis his hand is gone he is right. effectively stripped away the courtesy of his position so now it's just one-on-one -on -one. it's just him and the onion knight and um yeah it, it's it's sort of it's a contract that he is making that davos has to say yes to. it's almost like a um uh, like a the godfather kind of deal it's he can't refuse it he has to say yes even though wyman is giving him concessions that davos obviously wants he's saying i will recognize stannis as my king if you do this for me which he doesn't even have to do because again he has so much over davos in the situation right he offers davos the essential purpose of the reason why davos is there he offers davos the one thing that he can return to stannis and say i did it, mm -hmm. I, it like because I, I if i recall correctly didn't stannis say like don't come back unless you have secured uh, uh this alliance or, or something to that effect I, I guess with stannis something like that is always implied but he really needs wyman to say yes and wyman says sure i will do that that's fine but i need you to go on this crazy legit insane adventure <laughs> in order to do it um where uh, this adventure is extraordinarily risky and the risk is all yours buddy it is none of mine i am taking i am not even expending any of my own resources on this this crazy task yeah Have there's fun, this buddy enjoy it <laughs> Yeah, there's this quote from from Davos Four that I think really underlies the the flip side of this, which is how um, <laughs> Davos is being forced to risk everything, yet Wyman risks nothing. And you know, here's what Davos says: "You took a great risk, my lord. If the phrase had th seen through your deception." And Wyman responds. I took no risk at all. If any of the Freys had taken upon it, upon themselves to climb my gate for a close look at the man with the onion in his mouth, I would have blamed my gowlers for their error and produced you to appease them. Davos felt the shiver up his spine. I see. And so, yeah, like that's so, again, big power move by Wyman. He's making it very clear to Davos that he has nothing to lose in this situation and has no personal loyalty to Davos, but is doing this as, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, pure, you know, exchange of what the two parties can do for each other. Um, and again, that's such a great example of the way that Wyman thinks strategically. He's looking for a situation where it is impossible for him to lose. Yeah, it, no opportunity for him to lose. And there's one other thing I noted that really drives home just how masterfully he is using the situation to um, manipulate Davos. Well, he makes him grateful to him. He said, well, I didn't kill you. You're still alive. Uh, well, that's a bit, that's a big one. But also, secondly, the way he frames the deal and how he wants Rickon back to install him as the Lord Paramount is confusing for Davos. He doesn't understand what Wyman's endgame is for this, and it's emblematic of the rest of the way that he treats everybody else in the North. Davos agrees to it and feels uncomfortable and knows he's in danger, but doesn't know why, so he can't position himself to counter whatever is coming. It's... He's keeping even the person he just made a deal with guessing about what is the real purpose of this mission? Why am I being sent? It actually kind of reminded me in um, weird reference, Red October, when uh, Jack Ryan <laughs> is uh, is being sent on this crazy mission to go find the Dallas in order to track down the Red October. And he asks, like, why am I being sent? He's like, well, you're expendable. Davos is expendable here. And he doesn't even really understand the higher level politics that are going on between Wyman, the Boltons, and the phrase here. I love the Hunt for Red October reference. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. <laughs> it's a good one. Good movie, um, too. The what? I, oh, the movie's good. An yeah. excellent movie. So what do you guys make of the idea of, I guess from a lawyerly perspective, is there any way Wyman could actually enforce this? Like, doesn't isn't this like sort of like a contract made under duress or like with a gun to your head? Is there any way uh, that he would be expected at least like legally but also within the culture to to stay to this this deal he made with davos 
so who who would be bound? Yeah. Davos or Wyman? Wyman. Wyman be bound. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it within so if you're looking at it from a pure contract law perspective, um, there's an offer, there's acceptance, there's consideration, and there's mutuality. Those are the four elements mm-hmm. that that um, you you have there. But in addition, you have uh, Davos presuming that he actually does go off to Skagos, which I think everybody is in agreement that he does, mm-hmm. um, in reliance upon the notion that Wyman is going to meet this uh, or is going to f- carry through this contract. Um, yeah, I think, he, you know, from a pure contract law perspective, um, it's it's absolutely binding on, on Wyman. That said, one, these types of contracts are, are not in any way enforced in, in Westeros uh, mm-hmm. at all. Um, and there are some things that are going to happen that I, I think are going to make him actually performing under this contract impossible for a number of different reasons. So yeah, I think yeah. two things to bring up is so um, in contract law, there's a difference between something being void and being voidable. So if something is void, it means it it doesn't exist. Neither party can enforce it. But if something is voidable, then the wronged party would have the ability to Mm. uh, to say, hey, I don't want to go through with this deal. So in this case, duress is the kind of defense that makes a contract voidable by the wronged party. So um, Davos could say, make uh, make out a defense of duress and say this contract is voidable. But Wyman couldn't do that mm. because he's the one who engaged in the duress in the first place. So that, that's point one. Point two is, I think one thing that Wyman is relying on here is that the only real witnesses to this are Robot and Davos. And so and right. even if there were to be a situation where this deal were to be enforced, um, there's huge evidentiary problems yes. <laughs> with it. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, and that's the, that's the other step uh, that when you're analyzing things like a lawyer, first you ask, what does the law say? And second you ask, well, what does the evidence say? Um, and, and here there would be some, some evidentiary issues, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. There's, o- there's almost no proof this happened other than believing Davos who many people will not, <laughs> especially right. in the North. Well, right. And right. then and then remember that it's completely contrary to what Wyman did with Davos in public the chapter before. Um, so there's a ton of witnesses to um, Davos showing up in White Harbor and then being murdered, right? So, right. Um, but query, is Wyman in a lot of trouble when Davos shows up alive? Um and and I think he he anticipates to not have to deal with that particular <laughs> deception until the people that care are out of power. I think that's that's I true. That's right. An underlining part of this, the reason Davos is nervous, is that he assumes somewhere down in his heart that he's going to be killed if he fulfills his end of the the deal. That he's going to end up just another corpse floating in the ocean, and that mm-hmm. Wyman will keep everything for himself. And I think we get to the main point. Uh, so, do we think? that Wyman intends to keep his side of this bargain to Stannis and Davos. I put up a poll on Twitter. Uh, we ended up with how many responses? Uh, 479 responses. 44.5% of the people said that no. He had no intention ever to keep up his side of the bargain. He was always going to betray Davos as soon as he got Reckon back. 28.6% said he absolutely intends to keep his word to Stannis. That if Rickon's returned and Davos comes with him, Wyman will swear fealty to Stannis. And then 26.9% said he did when he made it, but the situation has changed and he no longer intends to keep his side of the bargain. So what what is your guys' take on those options here? Knowing what we know about Wyman and his de- his deals in the past, the situa- the very odd situation he crafts around Davos, how the way he's pressuring him and the way his plans seem to be moving on. I think that he probably did not intend to fulfill his end of the deal from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, while while he doesn't have necessarily a specific reason to distrust Davos or Stannis, we know that he's not above lying, and he says so specifically. He says, "When treating with liars, 
you know, and even an honest man must lie. He says that. So it, it's not like he's he's above. Or moreover, what is the essential purpose of what he would want with Rickon? Mm. I think you, we really have to look about look at that, and we've we've talked to, at some length about that. You know, and why it's not just Rickon, Rickon but why he needs the dire wolf too. Um, those are two things. It c- it could be theoretical any number of things from to see to Stark back in Winterfell as Lord Paramount. Um, he, he wants to do that. It could also be he wants to undercut Roose Bolton. But given what we know, given that we know for, uh, I think, a fair certainty that he was already planning to A, kill the phrase and B, attack the Boltons at Winterfell, I don't think, quite frankly, that Wyman himself expects to survive to mm. see Rickon returned. I think that he has Willis back. He has the one thing that he needed to to secure. And so from here on out, it's just middle fingers to the air. Fuck all you guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, you know, take down as many assholes as I can before I die. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wyman is a Northman is coming and so he's just like big bucket wool in that way that he wants to die with bolton blood on his hands he you know he's different from big bucket wool and that he's not a, an enormous person and a great warrior but he's going to do the exact same thing from my perspective i'm looking at this trying to put myself in my Andrew Lee's head he can promise the moon to davos seaworth because he's going to be dead hmm. in a couple of months in a couple of weeks even then it gets back to okay why does he want why does he want rick on stark well if he thinks he's going to be dead he leaves robert glover back at white harbor robert glover his best friend someone he trusts he also has winifred there maybe the the notion is okay he's going to marry one of them those two to rick on once they get him back or or betroth the two of them, and then they will bring the sort of combined power of, of the Glovers and the and Starks, Rick on Stark with his direwolf down on whatever's left at Winterfell, and that includes Stannis or whoever else whoever's holding Winterfell at the time. Or maybe he goes he's thinking he's gonna go to Winterfell and see what happens and maybe Stannis wins and then L in the very very extremely unlikely situation that Davos Seaworth shows up and it fulfills both conditions that are extraordinarily unlikely and he's alive and then he then he's gonna say well uh, that's not what I said ask my good friend Robert Glover <laughs> who was there the whole time but uh, oh by the way thanks for bringing back Rick and, and Shaggy Dog. That was super chill of you. Nice work. <laughs> My thought. I think, um, it, Clint, you have such a perfect summary of, of of what I think he, what I think Wyman's aim is, and it's that he never intends to be in a position to have to be held to the promise in the first place. That's so right. it just doesn't matter. What matters is the strategic advantage that he gets by making the deal in the first place. Um, and the only thing that I really have to add to that is that I think Wyman and Robert Glover telegraph their ultimate loyalty to the Starks um, to Davos over and over again in Davos 4, like at the end of the North Remembers speech, um, you know, when Wyman says, my son is home, um, Mm. Davos says something about the way Wyman said that chilled Davos to the bone. And Davos' response is, if it's justice you want, my lord, look to King Stannis. No man is more just. And Robert Glover breaks in to add, your loyalty does you honor, my lord. But Stannis Baratheon remains your king, not our own. And I think that explains very well where the loyalties of um, the Manderleys lie, even though they're making this deal. Their ultimate loyalty is still to the Starks. And there's no sense in which this deal um, 
is they're not shy about it. They're the Manderly is clear that that's that's what his interests are, and he's cooperating with Davos just as Clint said, only because their interests are aligned in this moment, and he doesn't expect to be held to the promise. Right. I think those are great points. I also missed a super chat. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Lumina M sent five dollars for saying, "Thank you for covering the brilliance of Wyman Manderly." Uh, the, he the brilliance brilliant of Wyman Manderly is undersold. Like he yeah. should be thought of in terms of like the highest schemers, the most intelligent people in the books. And but his his mask is so strong that I don't think a lot of readers really get to that point. Yeah, and people love Frey Pies as an act of revenge, but I don't think they appreciate the strategic genius that it takes to even put him in a position to have all that come to fruition. And one of the things I'm most excited about um, for Winds of Winter is to see how the rest of his military plans end up playing out. Mm. Uh, speaking of that, uh, I agree with you guys. I don't think Wyman ever had an intention that he would fulfill his side of the contract. Um, for one thing, there's we have an example in these chapters of somebody holding a, a person important to, De to Wyman hostage in Willis Manderley. As soon as he's returned, Wyman is essentially saying, I'm going on a killing spree. I'm like, the mummer's farce is over. Like, I'm going to break every deal I made and, and for this one big moment of revenge. And then he says to Davos, by the way, if you take if you get this very important kid to me and you bring him back and you hand him over to me, I'll give you everything you want. Well, he said that to the Lannisters and the Freys and the Boltons. Yep. He, he said, That's a great point. give me back Willis and everything will be cool forever. I'll be your best bros. And he is telling you that is not true. <laughs> so <laughs> it. it that's part of the reason that Davos must be feeling antsy because at some part of part of the back of his brain he's going, I'm being the, I'm being asked to make the same type of deal that he's telling me he's going to betray, and there's no reason as soon as Wyman or the Manderleys get back Rickon for him to ever keep his end of the bargain because the only leverage Davos will have is Rickon and the Direwolf themselves. What he should do if he sees through this is take Rickon and the Direwolf and go right to Stannis. He should not deliver them to White Harbor. He should not deliver them to Wyman. As soon as he does, he is dead. Maybe he'll figure that out if he actually succeeds. And it maybe seems like he will, because I don't think Davos' story will end on Skagos. But it, the way this deal is set up, it is set up for Davos to die or be thrown into a dungeon to be forgot about forever as soon as he keeps up his end of the bargain. No, Like you guys have said, nobody knows this deal is in effect. There's nobody there to back up Davos. He has no troops. He has no friends in White Harbor. This is a terrible idea for him to do it, but Wyman is putting it forward as like, you should definitely do this for me, despite the fact it's absolutely going to blow up in your face. It's. I think it's a a good example of the limits of the aphorism that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Mm -hmm. um, because just because you have mutual enemies with someone doesn't mean that you can trust that other person. Sometimes the reason that uh, people, um, sometimes the reason that people hate each other is because both sides are duplicitous. So allying with someone else who is duplicitous doesn't necessarily put you in a great situation. Nope. <laughs> Nobody should make deals with Wyman and Anderley. It's like nobody should, like, uh, since we're talking about rounders, nobody should play poker against Mike McDermott. But they continue to do so knowing that they're going to get screwed for doing it. No, don't I mean, get involved I, in a land war in Asia, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, or trust but verify. And I think your right. your point um, is is a really good one, which is it, he he might gain a lot of advantage from going to Skagos to get Rickon and the Direwolf, but he shouldn't take what Wyman has said on face. Instead, he should try to find a way to find another ally to protect him from mm -hmm. Wyman. Um, and that could be Stannis, it could be potentially John at the wall, it could be someone else. Um, but, but going directly to Wyman is a mistake because again, in the poker metaphor, Wyman is the big stack and Davos has no chips. Yeah, it's, um, it is absolutely set up for Davos to die, which probably means that he won't, that he's going to figure out another way. I'm hoping at some point during his journey in the winds of winter, 
he figures out that this isn't going to work out the way he wants. Um, Davos is a smart character. I, you got to figure at some point he's going to put this together. That the, that his leverage in the same way that Cersei should never send back Willis, he should never send back Rickon. Those are, it, it, but it's going to be hard for Davos because he has to put himself in the situation of uh, empathizing with Cersei Lannister and understanding why sending back Willis was a huge loss for the Iron Throne. He has to understand that political situation and those choices in order to apply it to himself. I think yes and no, but I think that I, because I think that Davos doesn't necessarily have to empathize with Cersei. He just has to understand. I mean, from Davos's perspective, his duties run one Stannis and two fulfilling the terms of this deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So the overlying duty that that he would have to respect is to do whatever is in Stannis's best interest. Yeah, true. And it's in Stannis's best interest to have actual possession of Rickon rather than figurative possession of an alliance with uh, the Manderleys. So I think it I think it's a fairly straightforward connection that I I, I agree with you. I think that us will make um you know we'll we'll have to see but And I think um, I yeah Oh, I was just going to say, I think even honorable characters um, recognize the power of hostages. And the example here is John taking wildling mm -hmm. hostages. Um, you know, we think of him as a as a character who does the right thing. But he recognizes the strategic leverage that's created by having a hostage or an important person. Um, and I think that lends credence to the idea that Davos would recognize the strategic importance of, of Rickon. At some point, he will. He does. He hasn't quite put together yet, but he's gonna have a lot of time to think while he's um, running to Skagos and back. Well, assuming he lives, um, I think we're just gonna skip the the last two sections. These were just kind of fun things. Is Va is Wyman actually Varys because they're both mermen? I think absolutely. Yes, a hundred percent. Like it is true. It is true. They are well. Not only are they both mermen, but they they think the same way. They have a way of turning disadvantages to advantages that are extremely similar. Like he's going to use Rickon the same way Varys wants to use Young Griff. Yeah, Wyman is time traveling Varys's clone. I <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to work it out. I don't know. And maybe his brothers from another mother. <laughs> Um, so I think we got about a half hour left. Uh, we're going to end at four and then afterwards go watch Radio Westeros. They'll be talking about Asha Greyjoy, I think with Z's oh. um, on their live stream. Uh, so awesome. start throwing them in the chat. Um, any questions you want us to answer about this? Any points we didn't cover? Uh, we didn't interact with the chat a lot this time. This was kind of a, a dense a dense topic so we're just gonna go ahead and do that now uh first question here was from one person named maester mary she says Ooh. Ooh. if the phrase and manderleys were baseball teams which teams would they be discuss please this is for you clint oh okay uh so if the phrase and manderleys were baseball teams the uh so the phrase are obviously at this point i mean Mary's going to hate me for this answer, but it's the Astros at this point, right? Because, you know, they're the big cheaters or maybe the Red Sox because they're also big cheaters. Um, <laughs> Mary would ask this question thinking that I was going to say the Dodgers and the Giants, but I'm not because that would be too homerish. But um, yeah, it's, pro it's probably the big cheaters are the phrase. And then the Manderleys are, let's see. The Manderleys are like a powerful team that is just laying out there. They're, they're like... The Mar they're the Mariners, right? They're the Mariners. That's so I will say I predicted your answers mm -hmm. in the document. She did. And, did you? And my first answer was why um, the Houston Astros and the Washington Nationals. And oh, I there you go. Thought of it better is that the Manderleys are actually the 2018 Red Sox when they beat the Astros. Uh, oh, at there you go. Yes, Thematically the resonant. 2018 Astros and Red Sox. That's that's where I'm going with it. <laughs> I love that question. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Maester Mary, wherever you are out there, um, wherever she is. Uh, a super chat from uh, Amanda Speedlands. I love you guys. Thank you very much, Amanda. Love you too. Thank you. 
Um, and one from uh, from YouTube, um, username Ziri, she said, they say, some people theorize Wyman Manderley and Dorian Martell are either glamouring, feigning, or personally inflicting themselves with um, they obesity, gout, etc. to throw off their enemies. What's your take on this specifically re relating to Wyman? For instance, we talked about how he uses his long shits as an excuse to go plotting. Do you think he actually has any health problems, or is that him, again, just taking a disadvantage and turning it to an advantage for himself? So I'm sorry. The question is: Do we do we really think that he has health problems? Yeah, probably. I, yeah. I absolutely do. I mean, the best lies are salted with a little truth, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's one it's one of those things where he's he's doing a a, a thing where it's like, yeah, I've got agita, I've got dis distressed uh, bowels or whatever, but he's you know he's able to deal with that. He just makes a bigger deal out of it so that he can have a little time to do some plotting. I think like we all do. Yeah, I mean, I think it it works really well because I think that there's um like a real emotional sense in which like Wyman dislikes the fact that people judge him as a coward mm -hmm. um, and as weak because of his weight. So him being able to turn that against each other to turn that against the people who are judging him, I think is a really powerful way to read it. So he takes something that other people have weaponized against him and then shoots it back at them in order to deceive them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really brilliant. And I think it's a, a really smart way that George has written Wyman Manderley. Um, you know, a lot of times you have characters who are unfair who are very shallowly written as villains um, and their appearance is just kind of used in a shallow way mm -hmm. to um, make them seem like a bad person or weak or lazy. But with Wyman, you have, you have the opposite. You have this extremely cunning person um, who has managed to um, turn stereotypes and judgments about his weight uh, against the people who are judging him. Yeah, I agree with those takes. He probably absolutely does have these problems. Um, he's in a medieval society. He's very overweight. He's relatively old. I'm sure he does have digestion issues. Probably it's just like you like you were saying, turning what is a disadvantage, something unpleasant, as a way to pull one over on the people who um, underestimate him. Just another way that his um, his mask that he shows the world is reinforced and used to his advantage, which is an incredible skill from him. Uh, let's see your super chat here from uh, Frank Bum. He says, please discuss, oh, $10, thank you, Frank. Please discuss how when talking to Bran, Wyman is the tracks of land guy from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. I don't get this reference. Ha ha, am I, I not so amiable, loyal and so non-threatening? Now about all this land. What, what would us Do you not get this reference? No. Have you not seen Monty Python I've and the Holy it. Grail? I don't remember this part. <laughs> Oh, okay. So there's a part where, what, what is it? It's been a while since I've seen it, but like this guy who's like trying to get his, uh, his clearly gay son to marry um, this woman who has huge tracts of land and what it, yeah. Oh, it's a, now I remember. You know? Okay. Now I got it. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. It's a, it's a euphemism for breasts. Ah. I, I believe that's what it is. Right? Classic. Yes. Sounds like it. Boobies. Boobies, boobies, boobies. Right. Boobs are good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, how does that relate to Wyman? <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, because it relates to Wyman because, like, he is at, it, it's like in the Hornwood succession. He's like, I want these huge tracts of Hornwood land, but he's also horny. Like, he <laughs> wants to bang his cousin. Horny for the Hornwood. That's the idea, I think. Yeah. Okay. Mary, you got anything? I got nothing. I wish I had something more witty to say, but I think y'all covered it. Y'all talked about boobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boobs is a good answer to that, Frank. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. Boobs are good. Uh, another super chat here from um, Liel Yakto Murr. I think that's how you pronounce that. Who helped Wyman kill the phrase and cook the, fr and cook the pies? Uh, good question. Uh, do you guys have any sense for who, which of his men actually did it? or is it even important i guess 
That's a good question. Is, is um, Robert going with them? I don't think so. I think he's back no, in White Rob, Harbor. Robert, he's in White Harbor. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, it's possible that he made that himself. He could be very good in the kitchen, right? Um, he seems like one of those guys who would really take it seriously. I don't know. Maybe he did it himself. I, I don't know have a lot of information about who is in the Manderley host that shows up at Winterfell. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head. I mean, do, do either of you? No. Um, I don't really, I think he has some cousins with him. Uh, he left Willis back in White Harbor. Um, while Doesn't he have a Winterf brother? I think so. Is his brother with him? Um, what is his brother's name? I'm trying, Marlon. I've got it. I can find it. Marlon yes, Mandley? Marlon with him? Yes, Marlon Mandley. He's the cousin to Lord Wyman. Um, he's the commander of the garrison at Newcastle and White Harbor. So I would expect, considering Marlon had a big part in the whole ruse at the Merman's court, that he probably led the mission himself. He's um, six feet tall. Wow. Um, he's haughty and disdainful. He's a knight. Yeah, this is probably the guy that did it. He probably led the party to capture the three phrase yep. and then start butchering them. Good good call. Mystery solved. There we go. Good question. I didn't I had never really thought about that. Um, another one here from Aaron M, uh, one of my patrons. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, she says, "Thank you guys. So nice to see Mary and Clint's faces." Agreed. And Clint's tattoos. Right. He's showing them off today. That's right. Showing off the guns. Gun sounds out guns out. Uh, much is made of Rickon being sort of feral before he leaves the story. Do you think Davos will find him a savage on Skagos? And if so, will that change his plans at all? Um, that That's a really good point in that Wyman has this big plan where he's like, he's going to get back Rickon, and then maybe he's going to marry him to one of his granddaughters, or he's going to be like the hand of the king sort of to Rickon, you know, rule in his place as maybe a regent or something like that, create this relationship between them. But he doesn't know Rickon. He doesn't know what he was like beforehand, and he doesn't know him now, especially after everything he's gone through. And that's kind of maybe a, a problem in his plan that he's underestimating the the magical side but also rickon's personality that he may not be down for having a, a manderly regent he may not be down for those marriages i mean presumably his time in the in the wilds and with on skagos has probably taught him to be stand up for himself much more than wyman has any inclination of yeah i love the thematic i love thematically the idea of rickon going wild um in in part because We've seen the way that revenge turns the Manderleys into, um, well, both the Manderleys and characters like Lady Stoneheart into very dangerous, unpredictable people who are constantly violating the norms of society, right? So I think if you have Wyman's Hope be this boy who has been driven mad by his grief and you know turned feral because of the the wild in lawless environment that he's thrown into, um, you know, a, a cannibal island. Not that cannibalism is relevant to Wyman Manderley at all. Mm. Um, I think that that would be very poetic, um, and it would be something that would work for for George to explore, like the downfall of this boy, a descent into inhumanity, almost paralleling someone like Reek, right? who's had a journey from being dehumanized back to being human. Um, Rickon having that kind of reverse arc would be really interesting. And I think that there's a lot of interesting things that George could do with that um, intersecting with kind of the, the Northern revenge based plots. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't really have any, anything more to add. Um, I, we're, but we can almost be assured that Rickon's will throw a wrench in whoever whoever's plans are still viable at the time Rickon shows back up, if he does. Also, it's unclear if uh, Wyman knows anything about Rob's will. The legitimization of John would absolutely blow up this plan. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, and people that are grand northern conspiracy folks tend to think it's possible that he might know about um, Rob's will. Mm -hmm. um, I think... If he does, if Wyman does know about Rob's will, that adds this 
fascinating layer to this entire interaction uh, to get Rickon back because then perhaps Wyman knew the whole time that Rickon was like a shaggy dog, an irrelevant part of the story. And he literally sent Davos on this mission just to get him off the playing board, just to have a backup. Um, and I, I don't know if I buy that Wyman truly knows that, but if he did, that would have just, it would give a really fascinating element to what, to Wyman's scheming in these chapters. That's very true. And especially because uh, there is sort of an underlying issue with like the Wyman marrying one of his granddaughters to Rickon plan is that Rickon is like six. He's, he's real young, but Jon Snow is right in the marrying age and he has two daughters um, right around the same age. And uh, Wyla in particular is a super devout Stark like fangirl. Uh, it's if he finds out about it and he has Rickon, I mean, he may pivot and say, like, you know what? John's the better option. He's the better way for me to secure this alliance to the house because we can make this marriage right now. I don't have to wait 10 years for Rickon to grow up, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, is the uh, the notion that... So I'm trying to think of the uh, mechanics of how Wyman would find out about the will. Is, the, is it the idea that Albert and Robert had some sort of conversation because Galbert is one of the people with the will. Uh, probably. Is that, is that the idea? Also, it appears that most of the people in Winterfell, maybe, um, maybe Dustin knows about it. Maybe the Umbers yeah. have found out. So it seems likely the knowledge of it is starting to leak out, at least in a dance with dragons after they get to Winterfell. I'm, I, I would question if he knows about it when he's making this deal though. It seems like the Rickon plan is so good for him that if it turns out, it gives him everything he wants. But if he, if this wills out there, it's it's so it blows it up so effectively that like why would you go through with it knowing that the will exists and all the other Northmen know it exists? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Like I I tend to one of the factors against the Grand Northern Conspiracy as a theory is that I I don't think that it makes sense for Wyman to support John because he would have more power with a boy lord mm -hmm. uh, as regent and i think that kind of it makes more sense for him to be scheming for a situation where there is a stark with less power that allows him to consolidate his power under the new situation mm -hmm. um but but you know like i just don't think we have enough enough information until we get t wow and i i'm i'm kind of inclined to just think it's interesting to think through all of the possibilities rather than landing on on only one. Yeah, good point. Um, question here from further up from Video Game Vision Quest. Um, this is actually maybe something better for <laughs> Aziz because he did his uh, Manderly episodes. Uh, were the Manderleys mermen before they went to White Harbor? Do they still have the same house mascot uh, when they were down in the Reach? Um, kind of a history question about them. I would suspect that they've always been the mermen. Mm -hmm. um, there's weird stories out in the reach about these weird about these mythical creatures, and the idea that they are the mermen is um, you see a similar. Well, it's kind of similar to the like the seahorse of the Valarians, where they used to they were sailors. They've probably always been sailors, so their seat of power probably had something to do with shipping down through Old Town or through the Mander. I mean, Mander Manderly, and they probably just kept that the whole time. I mean, they kept the the faith of the Seven despite going to the North. I don't think they would give up their sigil either. Yeah, that's that was the point I wanted to make. Is just. The, their name derives from a river in the south mm -hmm. where they used to when they were a powerful house in the reach um so i i think that it that that symbology has always been associated with them yeah i i, I would agree with that um and w one thing that i i think i wanted to mention earlier or at least note or put it in is um how much the manderleys show up in fire and blood um mm. That you know, I, I read Fire and Blood really closely because I was looking for like some evidence that Targaryens intermarried with a, a first men house in the north. Uh, because I was like, was there you know a, a, a previous ice and fire marriage? And there's like three, I think three instances of promising 
to marry of Targaryens like promising to marry and then it falls through for some reason one of them yeah. is when one of the the princesses dies while, uh, while she's like riding a horse drunk through the streets of King's Landing and then there's a couple of other ones um, and it, it was notable because um, it was clear that the Manderleys have always been trying to maneuver um, to gain more power right like that's sort of like a an ingrained um, aspect of of who they are but it's interesting in the in the sense that now they're trying to gain more power within the north and previously they were trying to gain more power um kind of in, in the south because that that was where the the greater power was and so now they've, they've realized no like they, they can actually you know kind of thing by looking north instead of instead of south but they've always been trying to maneuver to figure out ways to great to uh maximize the power of their their houses that's a that's a really good point um and also they were hand of the king i think for yeah they briefly for and they kept showing up in court in the south meanwhile the starks were essentially giving them the finger they stayed in the north as much as they could they didn't want anything to do with the targaryens and the seven and the rest of the seven kingdoms but like you said the manderleys have they've never forgotten their southern house and they've never forgotten that this this scheming sort of marriage alliance like mm -hmm. that may be like their superpower in a song of ice and fire that they seemingly yeah. have had hundreds of years of excellent excellent understanding of how to manipulate feudal politics which may be what got them kicked out of the south <laughs> um question here from guilty undertaker i believe this one is right up your alley would you say that the custom of taking hostages is tied to guest right your son or whoever is my guest will remain my guest with all protections and tales as long as you don't break faith what do you think mary i think that's really interesting um so i think that they're related in that um so one of the things that we talked about in our last episode is the relationship between safe conduct as a, a rule that's um, allowed in war and guest right. And so both of those um, safe conduct, guest right, hostages all come under this ambit of how do you de-escalate conflict when people are constantly at war? How do you provide for some situation where negotiation is possible, where truth is possible, where I can, you know, do something without a, with a guarantee that I won't get murdered? Um, and so, yeah, I think hostages are, are very much related to that, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, you know, Theon, when he is a ward in Winterfell, mm. um, he could be murdered by Ned if his dad did something wrong. That's the entire premise of taking hostages, that you're hostage for the good behavior of someone else. Um, and, and that's a really important part of Theon's character is uh, how it shows that the, the ward and hostage concept means that that person is in a necessarily un insecure situation. Um, so it's a little bit different from guest, right? Right. Because the ward mm -hmm. can be killed upon the happening of some other event with guest, right? It's a, a temporary, a temporary arrangement. Um, mm -hmm. but I all think that they're, they're related tools of negotiation, um, that are necessary in a world where there is no real international law. Yeah. I, I think that that's right. I think that, um, uh, they are they're very similar but one of the things that we talk a lot about is that what we found is guest right is a very thin right and we say that a lot and we what we mean by that is um it's a very straightforward obligation that doesn't have a whole lot of frills or additional bells and whistles to it it's just bread salt conduct for a short period of time and that's it there can be other aspects or other agreements or side events that play into um, how guest right is is consecrated um, but there there isn't like an additional aspect to it outside of just those four aspects offer acceptance consideration of mutuality the bread the salt the um, and then the mutual safe conduct safe conduct for guest and safe conduct for host that's it 
Um, so I, there, that arrangement creates a lot of other obligations, um, relates to a lot of other obligations, but it isn't, it isn't anything more than just those four things uh, for a short period of time. The that's our that's our position. And so taking a hostage is always subject to negotiated conditions. Like, mm, right. it, what does good behavior mean? Well, those, you know, in the context of <laughs> it was Balon not going to war against the Starks. Well, John takes hostages and the, the premise of the hostages is certain things that the wildlings have to do when they're let past the wall. Um, so it's always negotiable what the conditions are that are associated with hostage taking. Whereas with guest right, it's never negotiable. It's always, it's always right. the same. Although right. interestingly, there is, that's a great point. There's, there's a way out of guest right in the same way there is out of the hostages where it's not, it's a two way street. The guest also has to behave in an honorable way to you, whatever that means, or else it's kind of off the table. Like if you take somebody under guest right and they stab somebody while well, they have lost their guest right, that kind of thing. Same thing with hostages where, um, I, I, oh. I would, I would say it depends on who you stab though. Yes. So <laughs> yes. if you commit a crime so like, while being guest, you lose the guest right. I would say, um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah, but because because what if you murder if you if you murder someone that's not a member of the house? And so one of the things we talked about in our last episode was mm -hmm. well, what happens if the what happens if the Manderleys the Manderleys are the guests of the Boltons. So if the Manderleys have aggression against the Freys, or the Boltons have aggression mm -hmm. against the Freys, and those are both guest parties then does guest right apply when it's guests that are fighting each other? Um, <laughs> yeah, and, good question. I mean, I think it's sort of a kind of thing that lawyers would like to argue about that maybe it's not so relevant to the story, but it's, it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Um, the thing about Clint's point and your point about the hostages is, look, if Ned Stark had murdered Theon, then he's opening the door for it, he's lost his leverage. He's mm -hmm. lost his leverage for there to not be any um, war against, uh, brought by the Iron Islands against the North. So the the thing that's interesting about, about hostages is that they themselves are leveraged. There's power in having that person there. Um, and, and guess right, doesn't quite work in the same way. Unless you're Wyman Manderley when you can use it as a weapon, unbelievably. Hell yeah. Hell yeah somehow turning a mutual understanding of not killing each other and safe conduct into a way to absolutely kill somebody. <laughs> Amazing stuff out of Wyman. Uh, so we're reaching the end here. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, for showing up all the super chats and all the good questions we got. Um, why don't you guys tell people what you're doing next, where they can find you, all the plugs. Um, thanks again for having us. Really appreciate it. My name is Clint. Um, you can find me at, at Westeros Law on Twitter um, or at lawsoficeandfire.com. Um, you can find our podcast at Learned Hands Pod on Twitter. You can send us an email um, at learnedhandspod at gmail.com. Yeah, and you can listen to Learned Hands on whatever po podcast platform you use. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Stitcher. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find me uh, at Maester Mary on Twitter under that handle, or you can find my blog at upfromunderwinterfell.wordpress.com. What do you guys have uh, planned for your future episodes? Are you continuing the Wyman Manderley bonanza? <laughs> we, we're, we've been talking about that. We're not sure um it's one of the things that we have to agree on but we have we have like a long list uh you can imagine how long the list is mm -hmm. of possible topics and it's just like we got to pick one yeah we we, we a actually just got an email from someone who wants us to do an episode focused on white collar crimes and little finger and <laughs> wow um, i it's definitely on the list i think that's fascinating it's a pretty good idea yeah. That's a good idea. Well, look forward to listening to those. Um, how many episodes do you guys have out now? It's like six? Five. Five. Uh, okay. We just did five, yeah. We got a John d episode, a Danny episode, a Rob Stark's Will, and then two episodes on Guest Right. So 
all topics that coincidentally were about this topic in a way. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. thinking by somebody that picked you two. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and for me, obviously, uh, like, share, subscribe to the stream. Um, corn, these corn streams are continuing weekly. So next Saturday, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Haven't picked the topic, although I've, there's been rumblings, well, from me, that um, maybe <coughs> me and uh, poor Quentin and Bookshelf Stud might be talking about David Lynch in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, that might be a topic we're going to do. I usually make up the topic like tuesday or wednesday and then start planning um and then there's also my crusader kings two streams uh those are tuesdays at 7 p.m eastern standard time usually go for like three or four hours playing as the danes we have just taken the stormlands the crown lands and dorn and they had it coming they had it coming they're all under, right? under the sway of the danes those powerhouses from dorn um along with the seven kingdoms themselves and the riverlands so gonna try and get some dragons and stuff like that and my upcoming video which i did not finish because it got more involved as as it tends to do i'm gonna be talking about and winds of winter how exactly aegon or young griff ended up taking storm's end which seems like an impossible task which is why it's such a fun um possibility to explore especially with all the weird hints George has layered, especially stuff from Fire and Blood, which when you think about young Griff and the Winds of Winter, I think the last thing you'd think about is, oh, well, you'll figure out how this is going to happen in Fire and Blood. But I think George, as many have surmised, he used Fire and Blood as a draft for a lot of stuff he's planning in the Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring, and this appears to be one of them. So that'll, I'm going to try and get that out this, this week. Um, what you can do now... Well, what you should do is an hour from now, Radio Westeros goes live. They'll be doing a one-hour stream talking about Astra Greyjoy. I think that's with Aziz of History of Westeros. Um, I was on their stream two weeks ago talking about Melisandre in Winds of Winter. Um, check out that episode and their stream. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I will see you Tuesday. Not, not, not see you next Tuesday. I'll see you Tuesday. And, <laughs> and hopefully on Saturday. Have a good time, everybody. Bye.